I can hear myself in stereo. <laughs> it's like I need a bad phone connection, yeah. Um, welcome, everyone, first of all, to uh, Flying the Open Source Skies. Uh, we're looking at GIS and air traffic management. Um, first of all, uh, you know, a round of applause to all of you. Uh, when I saw that, I'd be speaking at 5 p.m. for an hour. I figured it'd be just me and the, uh, you know, audio video staff. Uh, so I commend you all for your, uh, uh, you know, diligence. Um, I've enjoyed all the good presentations I've seen so far today, and hopefully I can add something of interest uh, for you all as well. Um, I am a software engineer at uh, Mosaic ATM, which we'll get into just a little bit in a minute. Um, and what I'm going to be looking at today is basically a case study of a recent project that we did for the FAA um, called NCR, the NAS Common Reference. NAS is an uh, aviation acronym for National Aerospace System. Basically, the whole system, be it whether, be it uh, actual IT type systems or just infrastructure and, uh, and logistics and human organization that make up uh, the system that we fly around every time we get in a plane and travel somewhere. So here's what I hope to accomplish. First, give you a little bit of background um, into the, the, the world of aviation, uh, data, and systems. Uh, very small bit of it, there's a lot of them. Also, demo and application that we built uh, that I'm kind of doing the case study on today. And then go back and talk about some of the open source tools that were chosen to make that system and to discuss some of the challenges that we had and some of the solutions that we found to overcome them. Uh, and then just to apply some lessons going forward. forward. And I guess just to give some general context, um, unlike many of you, I'm fairly new uh, as of starting this project a couple years ago um, with a lot of the technologies that are so, so popular uh, here at this conference. And over these last couple of years, we've had the chance to really learn what role those technologies can play. And so my hope is that I can illustrate for uh, some of you who might be new to the FOSS 4G world, um, the advantages of using some of these tools over perhaps a you know, off-the-shelf commercial uh, product that you may have used in the past or maybe considering, as well as some of you who are already down the road and maybe looking for um, some of the tips and, trips, tips and tricks that we picked up along the way uh, in case uh, you know, it's something that you might be dealing with currently. So, um, Mosaic ATM, the ATM stands for Air Traffic Management, and we primarily do research and development for agencies like the FAA and NASA, um, focused on, on the aviation domain, particularly anything that we can do to increase efficiency or safety, um, both in existing systems or in, in the proposed systems that are being built. Um, this is a problem, and there's a few challenges here. Well, I guess I'm not quite to the aviation slide yet. There's more information if you want to know about Mosaic. Um, we also do non-aviation work as well um, with the same you know, analysis toward optimization. Feel free to go to those. So it's an interesting problem um, that exists in the aviation world. And before coming to this, uh, this job myself about eight years ago, <clears throat> I never would have imagined how much is really going on at even one airport at a given time, let alone the whole aerospace system. Um, take an airport like SFO here, I think it does something like a thousand operations a day, and it's doing that, I believe, on four runways, um, and to make life interesting, they're, you know, they're perpendicular. Um, there's rules about separation between the planes, so even not trying to be efficient, just trying to get everybody to where they're going, uh, <clears throat> or letting them leave SFO or arrive to SFO um, in a single day uh, is you know, a bit of an optimization problem or, or challenge um, when you factor in that there's thousands of other airports interacting with it and the delay in San Francisco causes you know, delay in Chicago or wherever they're connecting to. Um, there's a lot going on. So the FAA has a variety of disparate systems that provide data um, about some of these things that are happening. Of course, data is being transferred around uh, air traffic control. Um, however, this is a 
system that's you know, maybe 40 years old, and most of the data, as far as geospatial uh, data is concerned, is coming from things like radar. Um, some of the, you know, there are newer tools out there that are being used as well, but they may not be adopted on every plane. Um, keep in mind, we're dealing with you know, the uh, Deltas and United Airlines and so forth. We're also dealing with you know, the, the guy next door who has his pilot's license and wants to take the plane out for a spin. Uh, so there's a lot to, a lot to juggle. Um, and of course, regulations about how far separated the different types of planes need to be for, for safety reasons. Um, so this is where you've probably read about in the papers uh, NextGen, the proposed next generation of air traffic systems that the, uh, the FAA is currently has under research and development. Um, it definitely has an increased level of standardization. Um, the FAA is being, being very deliberate and methodical in involving various parties to uh, come to an a, agreement of, of the specs and of the systems messages that are being exchanged. Um, anyone from the FAA here? <laughs> All right, I can, I can relax a little bit and say, um, you know, from a developer standpoint, they're probably a little too methodical and, and deliberate. Um, and so we get, um, you know, schemas that um, if I print them out, I don't know if I could get them th through the door, um, which make it a little bit harder to work with from a uh, development standpoint um, because they're designed you know, to meet all the, all the needs of the different aerospace parties, um, but you know, <laughs> can't be bound with uh, Jack's B or XML beans unless you do a lot of work to really get the, get the uh, customization just right. Um, so anyway, these are some of the problems that, that uh, that exist in the background. Um, from a personal standpoint, uh, I think an example of one of the earlier things that I worked on um, in, this, er, in this arena, uh, you know, my first few years working in it was, was this application that we did post analysis on data that was going on in an airport. And we see it very well. There's little red dots coming along one of the runways. This is at Dallas Fort Worth. Um, those are basically radar hits. Of a, of a flight landing and then going to a, to a gate. Um, it turns out I've been doing GIS for a long time and never knew it. Um, I didn't write the part that, that renders this, but someone, once upon a time, actually wrote you know, the Java code to do the math to figure out uh, where latitude and longitude should be, should be drawn to the map. This map is just all in the code, Java 2D, um, rendering it, uh, you know, its own mapping system. So somebody was really smart on one hand, um, but maybe not so smart on missing out on the other parts uh, that, that exist already and they're out there nowadays. Um, in all fairness, the person not too smart was probably me because I worked on it in a time when these things have existed. The guy who wrote the original one, uh, or people who wrote the original one, you know, they probably uh, predate some of the great tools that we have now. So um, specifically onto the NCR project, and I'm just gonna check time periodically here. Um, airlines and pilots have a number of things that they need to be aware of when they're planning a flight, in fact, that they're responsible for. Um, there's a number of systems from the FBA that will publish information concerning things like weather, um, what we call not notums or notice to airmen. This is something like, um, you know, runway X at airport Y is going to be closed from this time to this time. Um, or maybe something is uh, going on in a certain area. Um, I was looking at one today for the, the Boston Center um, where they were uh, putting out a warning about an unmanned aircraft. Um, some kind of testing or something that was going on in the area um, to, be, to be aware of. Um, traffic management initiatives are things like ground stops and ground delays. I think here in San Francisco, they come up often uh, for morning fog, um, those sorts of things where the FAA kind of makes a decision, uh, this area or this airport is gonna be under this restriction until a certain time. So basically anyone who's preparing to fly needs to know these things and, and more. Um, Adding to the difficulty right now is that you can go to various websites to find these things, print them out, 
Um, and maybe you've got you know, a page full of notums that use very uh, cryptic abbreviations. A lot of it started in a time where each byte meant something uh, more than it does today, probably. And so a pilot or an airline is responsible for looking through you know, all these little acronyms and abbreviations and finding out, determining, does this apply to me? Does it have impact where I'm going to fly? And then making uh, those decisions. So the FAA proposed a system that would be um, a single interface to these disparate data, um, provide a graphical flight planning tool, and also provide a publish and subscribe interface. Uh, so you can imagine the, I guess, the two most common use cases are someone's going to uh, you know, embark on some flight, and they can go in and say, I'm flying from San Francisco to Salt Lake City, and I want to, I'm leaving at this time. Um, here's my plan, you know, speed and altitude. Tell me everything that I'm going to encounter along that route. And they can look and see what comes up and decide, maybe I should fly a different route, or maybe I should fly a little bit later or earlier. Um, and so it provides value in that way. The other use case, perhaps, is, uh, you know, maybe an airline who has several routes going uh, at different times throughout the day and wants to just subscribe to a service that will push out updates um, as, they, as they come. Uh, the picture is very dynamic. Throughout the day, weather is going to change. Um, throughout the day, different traffic management initiatives are going to come and go. Uh, so it, it does require updates. There will, of course, be time for questions at the end. But in the middle, here as we go, too, if, if there's something I'm uh, going over too quickly or or too slowly, <laughs> let me know. Uh, so here's a little bit of uh, the architecture that was uh, proposed and, and implemented in the prototype. Basically, on the left side there, you have uh, these various data sources um, that we want to import into the system. And so most of those are not really in a publish subscribe type uh, infrastructure. Most of them are things like go to some FTP site and pull something down, or uh, some of them might be as bad as, you know, wait for the monthly email. Um, but there are some that can be uh, where we can go access the database pretty quickly and, and move them along. Uh, so they go into a database, and then we'll have a kind of an application layer that sits on top and um, allows interactions with, with clients either in a web or either in a, an interface, it didn't necessarily have to be web initially. Um, or in a PubSub interface. So an initial prototype was built using uh, commercial off-the-shelf software. Um, in fact, the, the vendor um, we partnered with, and they, they wrote a lot of the initial um, foundation of it. Um, it was thick client and server, both Java applications, um, that met the initial needs, at least, which were um, a few things were stipulated by F the FAA, things they wanted. Uh, WFS, Web Feature Service, XML interface back and forth between the uh, clients and the server, um, and uh, to meet kind of the goals that we just, just looked at. Um, but a few challenges emerged as we worked on it throughout that, that time. Um, first, there were support challenges. Um, even though we were paying a fair amount. That didn't mean that um, the answers were always timely and uh, easy to implement. Um, sometimes they were, we need to make a new release. Um, sorry, you're demoing it tomorrow. Hope it works. Um, or um, it turns out it doesn't quite do that, but you can buy this extra add-on that can do it. Um, you know, some of those sorts of things. Um, it was obfuscated, the, the core libraries. So when we get mystery errors popping out of it, they'd be obfuscated stack traces. Uh, so it meant contacting them to see what's going on. Um, of course, there's licensing costs um, and the build and deployment. Uh, I talked about a little bit some of the uh, obfuscation and some of the uh, uh, updates. Um, the other thing that was annoying for us is it was very not Maven friendly. and um, for those that use Maven as a build tool, which, which we do, um, that meant we had to do a little manual work to get it in there. Uh, so then we switched to open source. We had a little opening between two phases of the project. 
and um, one of my colleagues, Brad, Brad King, was new on the project, and I think just having a fresh view external, um, he was able to kind of look at what, what we, some of the pain we'd been feeling and decide he didn't want to get involved in that pain, and, and we were ready to get out of it. Uh, so we started looking at other options. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we chose and why and how, um, but the quick summary now is um, open layers was used for the front end, largely because we uh, had one or two guys that had a little bit of experience with open layers on a previous project. Uh, GeoServer was chosen for the back end uh, with PostGIS for the, for the data. Really, for the most part, none of those, except for maybe a little bit of use with open layers, was anything we really had familiarity with. Um, but we had about a month between phases and thought we can just kind of plow ahead and see what, see what we can do in that time. Um, we had you know, the approval to, to, to make the change, um, and then we had our demo at the end of that month, and um, you know, we were all kind of fingers crossed. Did we re-implement enough of it so the client can look at it and say, okay, I see where you're going. Um, this is worth scrapping what we built the last 18 months and going this route. Um, instead, when we showed it on the demo, um, I don't know if they, they forgot the plan or if we just implemented enough of it uh, quickly enough they couldn't tell the difference because the only question they asked is, how did you make it so much faster? Um, and so for us, it was a big win um, as developers because we were really enjoying the, working on this stuff. Uh, we could work on it much more quickly. Um, and apparently within three to four weeks, um, we had replaced enough of the functionality to kind of, kind of fool somebody on a, you know, a superficial demo um, and had the bonus of it being faster. So not only were we going to get to continue with it, um, but it was looking like it was going to actually improve things. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a, a demo. And I had a little bit of a uh, monitor issue, so I'm doing this from, from down here. Um, the team was typically two developers, myself and one other, um, and a QA person, um, which was you know more part time than the QA. But occasionally we'd have a th we'd have a third developer um, in later phases. But not switching this one. Special prize anybody who can find my mouse. Oh, here we go. <laughs> All right, I don't know if I've ever displayed it on this uh, size, but we'll see what we can do. So this is uh, NCR. Imagine it with a nice, big, wide, pretty map, <laughs> which is hard to do on this uh, resolution. So uh, basically, the middle is the open layers display uh, with, I think, the top, uh, I don't know, 50 or 100 airports labeled. Um, along the left is just the different layers that can be turned on and off. And on the right um, is the various uh, options for configuring the queries that the users can put together. Um, some of these are actually a little bit complex, um, more so on the ad hoc tab, which I'll get to in a minute. But the, the key points are the times, uh, both the, the query time, which is basically um, put in for demoing with historical data. So we can basically say, pretend the current time is x. Um, based on that query time, which you can also choose to just be a clock time, um, what time are you going to depart? Um, basically, the parameters of your flight plan. Of your flight plan. Um, and then you can check any number of layers that you want to have returned, um, along with your, uh, you know, what your route is, which you can draw. And I'll, I'll show an example of that in a second. But to give you one that I know has some data in it, because um, I didn't load all history, you can load a saved query. And you can kind of see, it's hard to tell if this color scheme on the uh, monitor, but it shades the little area based on this um, 100 nautical mile buffer of where those coordinates are. And if I run that, it's going to start returning all the different data that it finds for that, uh, that time and that uh, flight path. 
that's a lot that we turned in this, <laughs> in this case, so it's kind of hard to make sense of some of it, um, which is why we can you know, come over here and turn on and off uh, you know, different layers or move them on top of each other or underneath each other, whatever the case may be. Um, if you look at one of these, I think this was the one I was mentioning earlier um, for the Boston Center that had unmanned aircraft operating in that area. Um, we have different levels of rules for different um, types of data. In this case, if you look at the text, um, it does say a two nautical mile radius of a certain point. Um, we're showing NOTAMs um, that don't have an embedded polygon, just as the whole center boundary. So things like that, that we can you know, kind of decide how best to show things, but the idea is that they're all there. Um, you can also, if I clear that, oops, let's not turn off this computer. Um, if I clear that, and clear that drawing, we can come and you know, draw a new line, let's say from, I don't know, Dallas area up to Pittsburgh and run it and to return whatever's you know, in there. This one right here looks like an AirMet, which is a, um, basically a weather report. I think this one is for, for turbulence. If you want to see an example of the type of messages that we actually will pull from uh, the FAA sources, this is one of the XML schemas for, XML messages for that type. Um, let's see if I clear things again and go to the ad hoc query. It's a little bit different. I'll talk through some of the differences um, as we go into the implementation. But the key difference is that the um, trajectory query uses a bit of a time, basically a kind of a sliding time window from when the flight departs to a prediction based on its speed and uh, filed altitude of w when it's going to land as, as destination, and then factors in where the flight will be at any point along that route against the time range of the, uh, of the restriction of the weather and maps together, um, I guess, in 40 with, with time and altitude, um, whether or not they're truly going to conflict. Whereas the ad hoc query um, is a, a little bit dumber, I guess. Um, but a little more simple, you can come in here and just uh, you know, draw a polygon anywhere that you're interested in, and it'll tell you what's there at any given time. Um, the one I wanted to show is right here. I've only selected LAMP and NARI, which are two types of um, gridded weather, raster weather. Um, I'll get to the implementation of that in a minute, but they, they don't come as, you know, any sort of imagery, um, it's, it's text. Um, and so part of the, the challenge was getting into imagery. But if we run that, um, you can see it kind of start populating there. If I hide that uh, drawing. So these are split, um, one for NARI and one for LAMP, uh, and into different weather bands, uh, sorry, time bands. Uh, I don't have any de-icing loaded today, but that one also has alt altitude bands. So you can see you can kind of turn things on and off as, as you go over time. Um, so at its heart, that's basically uh, you know, the, the demo side. Uh, and I'll come back to a couple parts of that as we continue here. Um, so what went into picking the tools that we picked? Um, we had kind of a, a wish list for each, each part of it. For the client side, um, we really wanted a web-based mapping. Um, this was really from a developer standpoint. It was something that um, you know, all the cool kids were doing these days, and uh, we wanted to get, it on, get in on it. Uh, but also, it just seemed like something that would be uh, a little more um, convenient for, for rapid prototyping and uh, for meeting our needs. Um, it needed WFS support, um, which is the web feature service, and it needed to allow the filter encoding schema, which we'd been using in the, in the old tool. Uh, WFS, show of hands, are people us using that and familiar with it? Okay. Um, 
I probably hadn't been before this project, but um, it does some pretty neat things, and I'll look at that a little bit as we go. Um, obviously, with the short time that we had to, to kind of change paths, we needed a quick learning curve, and we wanted something that was standards-based, because it turns out there's this whole JS world out there waiting for us to use their components if we can speak their language. Uh, the server-side wish list um, needed WFS and WMS web mapping service support uh, with filters as we've been designing them for the prior system, um, customized query logic, uh, again, quick learning curve and standards-based. For the database, um, again, a quick migration from what we're currently doing, easy integration with other tools, um, and really all this really needed going from we were already in the Postgres database but not yet utilizing the PostGIS extensions um, was just changing some of our importers. Uh, in the process, we became fairly conversant in the, the well-known text format, and really that was enough for us to kind of get our heads around how to translate things. It's probably not the fastest always, um, but uh, the way that we did most of the conversions. And we're using tools in a uh, in our Java-based importers like JTS that were doing a lot of that, uh, that for us. So the WFS query is what you saw primarily on that first tab um, that's returning the different layers. We need it to be filtered uh, spatially as well as by uh, any number of custom properties that a user might select. Um, I didn't go into much detail on it, but as well as the the time parameters, a user can say, um, uh, you know, can enter like wildcard text on any property of any of the layers. Uh, so we can really narrow it down. You know, if you want to see only um, airports that are above a certain elevation when you're planning your flight, you can do that. Um, and then ultimately that sliding time window I talked about, as well as an altitude window. Um, if you're flying, uh, you know, at 30,000 feet, and there's a notum affecting something at, uh, you know, the, at the airport surface, maybe up to 1,000 feet, uh, you don't really need to be notified of that. Uh, so the solution was to create a custom filter function um, as a plugin to GeoServer. Um, we were happy to see that GeoServer, when we were initially kind of reviewing a few options, uh, allowed this customization. Um, and We were then able to extend the open layers code, um, which even though the function call is allowed in the WFS schema, um, open layers didn't yet support it in its um, filter encoding. And so we were able to, to make that adjustment. There's a, a patch available on GitHub. Uh, if you want to follow up after, I can get you the, the URL if you're interested. Um, however, I should note, all this was done open layers two, right before open layers three came out. So um, you know, some of this may already be, be enhanced. Um, I should make a, you know, a shout out to Andrea and some of the guys that are uh, working on, on GeoServer. There's a few things right up front, just kind of learning how to use it. Um, most of it was very easy with the filter function. Some of it wasn't too intuitive to me, but I was able to get quick support, uh, just going to the forums and asking questions, um, and that made a big difference. Um, so in this case, and, and you'll notice this theme, I think, throughout, um, we felt like we were getting better service for the free. <laughs> Uh, software than the ones we were paying quite a bit for. Uh, so, so kudos to, to the uh, GeoServer team. Um, it was surprisingly fast to me. We were going through a lot of data, um, and uh, it, it worked very well. I said it's still to be used sparingly because it is doing extra work that you otherwise don't need to do. So it's always going to be faster not to have to go through an added function. Um, but the one or two times where it was needed, it, it worked well. Here's just a, a quick high-level look at that. Um, this is before we added the altitude filtering, so um, it's a little bit, um, doesn't have that last step. But if you imagine a flight going from an origin airport at 1 p.m. toward this destination, um, and there's a SUA, which was a uh, special use airspace, like if there's, they're flying over maybe a military installation, uh, and SIGMED is a type of uh, weather data. Um, we know the speed of the, of the flight and what its, uh, its buffer that the person, the, the end user was interested in seeing. 
So we can tell that at the time of the SIGMET, the flight's going to be somewhere in this area. And so we can see, yes, that, that does overlap. And so therefore, I, I need to return that uh, on the map. Whereas during the time of the SUA, it's in that green shaded region. And uh, so even though it is on the path, we don't need to show it. There's a number of these things, by the way, that um, we were coming up with some of these plans when we were very new to it um, that worked well. And maybe we didn't revisit it as much as we uh, might have had we known about some things that maybe some of you know about. So if that's the case uh, and you see something that I, we did that was crazy, um, feel free to let me know. Um, so the other challenge was the good weather. For, for various reasons to get the level of filtering that we wanted, uh, like the WFS had, we had the incoming data, which looks, you know, something like this, a big you know, two-dimensional array, uh, where maybe a top corner or something is geolocated, and the rest we know maybe the size of the cell, but uh, otherwise the value. Um, these, were, these were initially imported as individual features, each one, uh, so that we could still do the same filtering with, uh, with the WFS uh, filters. As you can imagine, that filters beautifully, um, but it takes time, it's, it's slow. So uh, we attack this from a couple ways. Um, like I said, it's easy to filter, but it's slow. And I should mention it was slow uh, in two ways, going through all the data, the, the, the data query, um, the rendering it all on open layers when it came back. Um, but interestingly, the, the download size of just so much data, uh, you select a big region, maybe you've got like 90 megs uh, features coming back. and. Uh, uh, it just takes a while to, to get it back. So we know we had to try something else. Kind of attacked it from two angles. Um, switching it to WMS uh, improved performance significantly. It also meant that instead of getting that 90 meg uh, download, we had consistent, I think they're like 60K uh, tiles uh, that come down. Um, also, you get you know, a feature of most web mapping tools. As you zoom in, you kind of improve resolution. Uh, and that wasn't necessarily a requirement, but it looked cool, and, and uh, the client liked it. We also uh, want to make an attempt to, to reduce this. Uh, I mentioned, mentioned Brad, my coworker. He kind of tackled this one and noticed there's a few things that we can do to reduce the workload. I covered this, by the way, just kind of randomly. I made up this data set. Um, if you imagine this is weather with uh, maybe a probability of precipitation with a higher probability in the middle, and then it kind of fans out to lower probabilities. So if we set a threshold of like two, then a lot of that we don't need. We're already down from 80 to 33. If we go another step and uh, group together neighboring values that are the same into these kind of, you know, varying shape polygons instead of individual blocks, uh, then we're down to 21, and the end result looks the same to the, to the user. Uh, so just things, things like that made it quicker, less work to do. Um, another challenge, using open layers, and I imagine to some extent this is true of, of any tool, um, any web mapping tool, is uh, you have to decide what to do with the international dateline um, or primary data if you go the other, other direction. Um, so everything worked swell until uh, we started dealing with some international flights. And uh, I don't know if you can see some of this very well, but here's a line that I drew from LAX to Sydney. And here's what was returned, taking the long way around the Earth. Um, this bottom picture is a polygon covering a good chunk of the Pacific. Um, rather than return what's in that polygon, it looped around the Earth. You can see the shaded region. Uh, if I pan to the right, the shaded region reappears. But either way, over the United States, you can see all the data that was returned. What version of DSLR did you say? Uh, this was 2.5, I believe. 2.4 probably initially, then 2.5 when we released. Okay. Um, I saw a plan good. Kit hub on the DNG submitted. Um, I'm not sure if it's DHA, but it looks like something. So that's very possible. And 
probably means that we need you know, update some things. Um, in our case, we got around it um, with you know, elbow grease and JavaScript. Um, and I remember looking at one of the forums online about ideas to get around this, um, and somebody explained it. I wish I could have gone back to attribute this to them. That uh, however you project it, whatever system you use, you have to cut it somewhere. And he said, if you don't believe me, try and peel an orange without any cuts. And uh, somehow that stuck in my head as a, you know, a logical explanation of why I can't do it quite how I wanted. Um, so we did a few things. And I think uh, a little bit newer tooling has made some of this less. And also, just as we've learned a little bit more, uh, probably didn't need to do quite as much um, hacking around things as we probably did. But first, I just came to the you know, realization that um, open layers liked to go west to east. And so lower numbers in the west, higher numbers in the east. Um, if you cross the date line going west, then you need to give it a number lower than the number you had you know, before the date line. So just inverting the 180, you, know, you come up with like a coordinate like two negative 237. Um, and really, this, the user never really sees this. This is just used for rendering purposes. Valid points are still going to GeoServer and back. Um, and I should say, uh, I'd have to look at, the, look at the actual messages and remind myself, but you could probably argue that GeoServer is doing its job properly the whole time. It's just um, the way we're using open layers occasionally gave it a, a, you know, a bad query. I had the same problem before. So I, instead of we just fix the map and we got rid of the date line problem that way. Oh, okay. Okay. Something to look into. Yeah. Cool. Um, we were actually at a uh, a demo um, with the with the FAA with several other international partners, um, and and we you know used our system at, for part of it. And there was another uh, contractor there you, demoing a, a system for did something else for for tracking flights um, that was leaflet based, um, and. We were kind of watching theirs to see how it performed. And we've done some similar, uh, smaller development with leaflets since this time. Um, but sure enough, at one point, a flight went international. And we saw theirs kind of like skip around uh, crazy. And so we're like, OK, good. We did our testing there. Um, here's where we got a little wacky, probably, with, with GeoServer. And um, I, it worked well. And I've thought of afterwards some obvious ways I could have done it better. But for these queries that cross the date line, we end up splitting them into two queries. So in this shaded region, what I was trying to show is this line. This is actually two polygons, one on one side of the date line, one on the other. And so we'd send them both through, get the results back. Um, using the, the filter encoding, we'd build a filter for one of them and then for the other one. Um, and this is probably a good time to show what some of that looks like um, if you haven't dealt with it before. Um, let's get a request. So this is not the right size for this, but um, so this is the actual geometry that we're sending in, not necessarily for a dateline query, but one that I had saved. And then you can send in several of these where we're checking properties, we're checking what their values are, and then ultimately the call to our filter function. So you can kind of build one of these XML queries for, for each of these that you send through. And we got them both back. And then, of course, things like our left-hand menu of layers had duplicates, and there's some challenges. So we then had to kind of merge them back together. Um, in the end, it worked fine, but it was a little extra work. What occurred to me, like right after we you know, shipped it, uh, so to speak, you know, demoed it, and we're done with the project, um, you know, I do all these ands and ors in here. I, I could have built both filters and then anded them together and made a single request. Um, I assume. I uh, haven't had a chance to go back and change that yet, but that's probably would have been the, the smarter way to do it. Um, but again, there's ways around the, the problem, just something to be aware of that you may encounter dateline issues. Um, this is the response that comes back. 
from, from a query. Um, GeoServer Punch handles all of this based on the database table that we're querying. Uh, you can also request other formats. Here's one uh, formatted in JSON. Uh, so there's options there. And I didn't show you while we were here earlier um, the gradient for the weather imagery um, was done with a, uh, a geoquery style, um, just pushing a, you know, setting rules for how to map the colors on a curve. That property, depending on the value of it, 0, 50, or 100 will be one of these colors, and then it interpolates in between. So, uh, so that was another thing to work through. Uh, then there's some, some overall lessons learned. Um, in our experience, working with the open, the open source tools uh, versus the commercial one we had before, there was, just, there was just no comparison. It was in every way easier to work with, performed better. Um, you know, that may have been that we weren't using the right tool in the first place. Uh, and that's, and that's probably true. Um, it was one that was kind of handed to us. Um, but I guess my lesson from this is if you're, cons if you're in a company that's maybe not gone in too far yet with uh, some open source options that are out there, uh, don't be afraid to do so. Um, documentation has been good. Great response from the community of users uh, and highly customizable. Um, the other lesson is to leverage open standards whenever possible uh, because somebody's already built a tool that either does your job that you want or perhaps is building a tool that you may someday need. And if you're communicating with the same file formats and everything, you'll be able to use it. Um, the other one is be explicit about coordinate systems. Um, we have had a lot of times where we put something in the database, but maybe forgot to specify that. I don't know why it's optional in post-GIS, I guess for Cartesian. Um, you know, the coordinate system, and then you get a query back, it doesn't come up right, you dig through and find the error, uh, what, mismatch coordinates or something, and uh, that one costs a few times. And then finally, and I think this, this plays in well with uh, t the talk this morning, I think it was, uh, was it Lizzie from Mapbox talked about on-ramping, uh, great talk by the way. Um, this was kind of our on-ramping, on I didn't think about that before, but we actually started you know, learning real GIS instead of just learning some commercial API. And it turned out that um, you know, doing it for real was easier than doing it through some helper tool. <laughs> Um, and uh, it really opened up a lot of opportunities going forward once we knew how to do that. Uh, so in my mind, the open standards plus the open tools kind of makes it interchangeable building blocks. Um, I'm most proud of this slide of any of them because I couldn't find one that I wanted, so I grabbed some of my son's Legos and took a photo. <laughs> uh, so whatever else you do or do not learn today, remember that's a good Lego picture. I'll open source it if anyone wants it. Um, so we've been able to do a few things since then. Now that we've kind of have these tools in our, in our tool bag, toolbox, uh, as we've approached new projects, we've taken a lot of these things with us. So I showed you at the beginning of the, of the, the conversation um, the tool where we were kind of manually drawing everything out of an airport. This is a uh, more updated version that we put together using OpenStreetMaps uh, where it, shows both arrival and departure paths into Dallas-Fort Worth. I forget which colors which one is arrival, one's departure. Um, and has all the you know, power of OpenStreetMap, so you can kind of move around and look at where things are. Um, a lot of time and money is spent in the industry to um, put together what we call adaptations to basically configure the coordinates of like where runways are and all the details of an airport. Um, so that we can do data analysis and say, how long did this plane spend on the uh, taxiing or how much time was in the runway? Um, it's amazing to me that the, the free open street maps, if you zoom into the airport, it's as good you know, as, as most of these that are manually done and updated regularly. Um, there's some very specific airport you know, elements that uh, maybe aren't you know, spelled out as well in those as in the custom ones. Um, but um, you know, our custom ones are not going to have like a new gate <laughs> that's popped up until someone goes and adds it. 
Um, you can zoom into uh, DFW and even pick out you know, where you're going to eat dinner in between flights. Um, ours don't do that. So uh, you know, great work on OpenStreetMaps for those that, that work on it. Um, late last year, the FAA also released a, a new program, um, CTOP it's called, in which um, you know, certain routes might be closed down, alternates need to be chosen. There wasn't really a tool available to airlines at first to, to automate this process and to let them view the options. Um, so we were able to very quickly you know, take the same pieces that we, we had been putting together in recent months and, and uh, you know, make that available to customers. Um, I should mention we, we do also you know, work with airlines and, and other commercial entities, not, not just uh, government agencies. This is another one that um, was done in the company recently that I only worked on a little bit. Um, it's showing all of the um, locations of windmills throughout the country, um, largely for surveillance and maintenance on them. There were, again, so many that doing it all uh, as WFS you know, vector data um, was too slow for rendering. Um, the other developer, uh, Mike, that's working on this, uh, switched it to WMS. And he discovered something that I had missed uh, with the weather, the get feature info. We call get feature all the time WFS. Get feature info on WMS lets you, you know, click that point, send in the request, and get back those properties and the data that you would have gotten in WFS. Um, so you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. Uh, you can get the WMS imagery, but you can still make calls out for the actual underlying uh, data attributes. Um, this is just one that another developer did recently that I, I thought was, was kind of cool, um, just because of the new symbology that was opened up, uh, new options there. So miles and trail is uh, another restriction that's placed on flights at times, uh, basically saying an amount of time or distance that needs to be uh, adhered to as a minimum between flights, say as they're arriving or something. Uh, maybe conditions are such that they want a little extra separation for safety. Um, so uh, a couple of our guys, one of our analysts in, in MATLAB actually put together the, the, the geo data and then uh, one of our developers added to the map. Each of those um, indicators, I'm trying to remember exactly how this worked, each of those indicators you know, show a mile and trail. I think the line at the base is, um, no, sorry, the box is the airport. The line at the base, uh, the distance of it indicates how far the miles and trail uh, needs to be adhered to, and then the arrow points to the, you know, to the airport that's going toward. Uh, so just, you know, a lot more information is able to be encapsulated at one glance than would otherwise be there. And then lately a lot of our work has been moving more toward real time. Um, it's a system where we can actually, you know, look at several airports, see real time traffic moving on them, um, using web sockets with a, with a node uh, service behind it, pumping flight states and positions out. Um, but we still use GeoServer behind it to then go and get um, underlying data. Uh, as well as the various you know, NAS restrictions and things that we've already looked at. Um, so I guess once we've kind of moved this direction, it's opened up a lot of opportunities. Uh, so that's the end of what I've got. Um, any questions or suggestions that I can uh, talk to? Yeah. Where do you get your weather WFS information? Um, a variety is, a, is the answer with, with a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of these sources. So, First of all, the WFS weather, uh, the WFS portion is what we, we build into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, the weather we get comes from a variety of sources. FAA uh, for, for some of it, some types. Um, I believe at some point we had some from, from NOAA. There's a, there's a commercial company too that's escaping me right now. Um, but that also will kind of vary by the, by the project. Um, if we're doing a job for the FAA, they say, hey, we have these sources that we want to we use, have at them. Um, if we're doing it for uh, you know, a commercial airline, they might have their own feeds that they want us to tap into. Um, and one of those clients may not have access to the data of the other client. Uh, so it requires a little bit of uh, flexibility. Did you have any trouble? 
you have to do any custom parsing of that stuff when it came back, or did Open Layers handle the weather? Yeah, reading the. the uh, we had to custom parse pretty much everything when it was inbound. If we look back at that slide uh, earlier on, you know, there's various data sources on the left, and then the the importers. Those importers are basically this little Java um, guys that we wrote that we use Camel to feed data through. So whenever we got a new input data, it pretty much had to go through an import that was written just for that source um, to convert it into ultimately the post-GIS geometries that then GeoServe and everything else could work with. So not much customization we needed at the open layers level because the data had already been you know, uh, cleaned. Uh, and then GeoServer did the rest in between. Others? Andre? Uh, yeah, so we've done a few just kind of initial tests, you know, tinkering with it. Um, there hasn't really been, you know, like a contractual impetus yet to, to go there, um, but we've done some internal testing and um, I think it's where we'd, we'd like to go. We do have some simulation software um, that's not web-based at all, um, that does some, some 3D. Uh, we'd, we'd like to get there for, for the web, but we haven't yet. What kind of components are you doing? What's that? What kind of components are you I don't think I've even been far enough in that conversation yet to remember, to remember where, we're, where we're headed or what options are out there. I, I think the fairest answer is, uh, you know, to be determined. So if, if you've got one that you, uh, you know, want to send my way, I'm all ears. Yeah. Have we ever? Um, and that is the, uh, you know, I was mentioning earlier the size of these schemas. Um, in fact, if we look at the uh, demo again. Uh, the one I popped up was uh, Wixom, but Axum as well as in here, AXM. Uh, let me go back to this guy. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's a few things going on. Um, we have not configured GeoServer to generate them. Um, they come in an input, often an axum. Uh, we parse it, we stick it in, in PostGIS. Um, we're always just making the, the plain WFS request to uh, GeoServer and getting back GML. We do have um, that publish subscribe service, which is running on the side, basically, and will post process data coming out of GeoServer to format into Axum uh, where necessary. But generally, we, we can kind of cheat and just save the incoming Axum in a different table. And then when a user triggers something that tells us in our regular post-GIS geometry that these are the same, we can go grab that Axum and send it to them. Uh, so we don't really operate an Axum natively, if that makes sense. But we do have to translate it and out of it. Any others? Last chance. All right. Oh. So I had, um, what was the commercial software you were using, and what challenges did you face importing it into your PostGIS database? And do you still have challenges importing that data? So it was the same data. Um, it was just, you know, instead of importing it uh, into PostGIS using PostGIS you know, geometric types. Uh, geospatial types. We were storing it, you know, like the longitude column, the latitude column, and then we had to, um, when we would read or write it, basically convert it into these types that um, the commercial software used. Um, it's probably painfully obvious. I haven't said the name of the commercial software, um, and I, I don't know if I want to, you know, wrinkle any, rustle any feathers there, um, but um, so maybe I'll keep that out for now. <laughs> At least while the mic's on. Because okay. <laughs> <No. laughs> I've had some challenges with that too, and I'm just wondering if, if, if I've gone down the road before you or. Yeah, it could be. And the, um, I, I guess the message I was hoping to get across with this really is if you're, if you're stuck in that cycle 
of a tool that's not working well for you, um, but maybe feeling like I did a couple years ago of, hey, it's not very good, but it's what I've got. It's, you know, it's the devil I know. Um, it, there, it really is better once you, once you get rid of it and move on to, the, to using you know, the right tools for the job. Um, and I think far more often than you might, we might naturally be inclined to think um, in you know, corporate America or whatever, uh, the, uh, the open source options are, are as good or better, uh, as documented or better, um, and much better price tag. All right, any others? Thank you all for coming. Thank you.